and everywhere you go. <laughs> How you guys doing? Uh, I'm not sure if you're sitting right. <laughs> it's all good. So we're here today with three folks who manage entirely different teams. Um, as we we're just talking about backstage, none of you are super old, none of you are spring <laughs> chickens, but you guys are all dealing with folks who are a couple decades younger than you, right? Ralph, you know, you're, you're players, you're creators, 20s. Um, yeah. Christina, your, your audience of, of viewers or what? Anywhere from four years old to 50 years old. And Andre, how, and your players are mid-20s? Yeah, from, from, from 18 up to 33, let's say, but a, a younger generation for sure is the one that uh, is more in momentum. But let's start with Ralph. I mean, how, do you, how do you think about that? The fact that, you know, I'm sure you're constantly questioning, do I have the right read on my audience? Um, obviously, as a CEO, folks will see, wait a minute, he's not 25 like all my friends who are doing this. How often do you spend time thinking about the fact that this could be a liability as a leader, the fact that there's a bit of a, there's a, bit of a gap? I mean, it's literally just starting now because I start to recognize that I'm not the youngest guy in the room anymore, which I always used in, in business meetings, in even running the company kind of-ish. So, um, I still try to play as much video games as I can, so I'm, you know, on the pulse of what we're actually talking about. But it's it's simple. You need to listen more than you used to, right? There you go. <laughs> How about you, Christina? Do you pull your kids to kind of <laughs> gauge what they're interested in these days? So I would say that our job, no matter what we do, is to always know your audience, right? So I don't think you're ever allowed to not or stop paying attention. And in the youngest set, we're actually the first media they're consuming sometimes. So it's about generational research on the youngest. And the rest is, yeah, just making sure we're listening, that we're surrounding ourselves with a diverse cast of people, both from a creative talent set as well as an employee set. But it is something that you always have to be mindful of. Right. Andre? Well, he, he, on football sense, I think uh, what players appreciate in the end, independent of the age group, is, is that if, if you are able to develop them in, in a certain way. I was just telling you about my, my Chinese experience in, in Shanghai. And uh, the good thing there was that the, the players there didn't have the experiences that us Europeans or in European football have uh, normally. So they were very keen to learn on the basics. Uh, they are all always uh, late developers. Uh, they develop at the age of 16, 17, so which is a little bit late for a football player. So they were very keen on, uh, on learning. So uh, for me, uh, it was uh, great to give them this uh, knowledge that I had. And, uh, and this willingness from them to, to learn uh, uh, these basics that we already have in, uh, in European football. Right. And all you guys obviously have to, you know, n none of you guys are leaving this business anytime soon. Um, when you have an audience of folks who are a couple decades younger, like, do you, do you just begin to think about generational transition earlier in your careers? Do you begin to think about, like, hey, I need to hire a deputy who's even just like a decade younger than I am? Is that how often? Like, I imagine, obviously, a lot of people think about generational transitions when they're in their 50s or in their 60s. You know, you guys are all in your 40s. Um, have any of you guys begun doing that earlier in your careers because of the fact that you need to make sure you're in touch with, you know, people who are going to be playing in games or watching your shows, like, that are being born today? Well, I, I think first, when you look at hiring, I think what, what I tried or we always tried to do is to hire people with passion in balance to people with skills, right? <laughs> so it means um, people who, who, who live and breathe what we're doing. We're always trying to hire 50% out of that group. Not so much important how skilled and trained they are. We, we need to take that job to some extent. And the other half should be professionals who just know what they're doing. I think by that, you, you're solving for half of that problem. Because professionals are going to be older, generally. They're technically older, and they might not even, if they're the age demographic, they might not be fans of our content or of our tournaments, or they're, they're not interested in what we're doing. So we've always been a passion company. We need to keep that. So right. we need to be smart in hiring to, to preserve that DNA internally. I think that's step number one. Step number two, again, is, is listening, talking to people, going to events like this, if we do an event like this, I have to sit down in the audience and talk to people and try to understand what they're doing and encourage my team to do the same to yeah, never stop listening after all. Christina, I imagine you can't just go ahead and hire 10-year-olds to be this, you know, your deputy at Cartoon Network, but... 
Well, it's interesting when I hear everybody talk about it because, you know, for a while, millennials were the big concern, and now it's Gen Z as they're all going to head off to college. And we're actually service, serving them before anyone because of the younger network. So we're spending a lot of time uh, understanding that audience, which eventually becomes our employee. So I think much like you're saying is that we have a lot of animation enthusiasts that have grown up watching us. Cartoon Network itself is 40 years old. Um, Adult Swim is, you know, 15 years old. So they've been in the marketplace for a while. So it's easy for people to come aware and want to do animation, want to do animation with us. So it is about the enthusiasm, building community of artists, and being able to infuse that with executives and employees because it's as much about the creators as it is about the executives or the um, employees that surround those creators. If we're one without the other in, in age group, we won't find success. There you go. Andre, you have been a, a manager of some pretty high-profile football teams, right? Yeah. Teams like Chelsea, Tottenham. You're, you know, there's always, and this is a question for Christina uh, also down the line, there are always people who are critics of you who, who are doing so publicly, right? Yeah. You know, it's not just like people, you know, sharing with their friends what a terrible, you know, performance <laughs> by Chelsea, but, you know, they're calling for your head all the time. You know, you've bounced around a couple different teams. There's always critics, right, in yeah. sports, right? People who say that it's the coach's fault. I'm just curious how you manage that as a leader, the yeah. fact that so much of your life is, like, playing out on like yeah. national television. It's not easy. Uh, it's not an easy part. Basically, what, uh, what the social network has brought into football is the urgency and the demand for the short-term results. Um, if you want to see something funny, try watching Twitter whilst a football game goes on. And, and the hatred and hate that it's inside the comments of, of people. Uh, do, you, do you search for your name to you know, make sure keeping up with? Uh, no, uh, you know, uh, I am outside of social network. I have decided that, uh, you know, in, in my profession uh, is one of the things that uh, I keep track on, but I am not on them. Uh, basically, be, uh, you know, not, not being a fan or, or more a fan of another one, but uh, uh, Instagram is a little bit more soft than, than uh, Twitter on Facebook. Twi Twitter, in my opinion, has become a, a, a hate opinion. If you want to hear about something bad about someone, try searching uh, Twitter about it. And, uh, and uh, you know, of course, it has positive tools and, and, and positive content. Um, I'm, I'm just speaking about some exceptions, of course. But uh, in terms of, uh, for us coaches, it is difficult to deal with it because it raises expectations in people. Uh, football is about, of course, uh, success, short-term results. Uh, but we need a certain amount of time to establish our ideas and, uh, and the social network is shortening this amount of times that we have to, to, to make success because it's raising expectations of people towards uh, success. A and in some way, you know, modern society is a little bit less tolerant for the people who fail or for those who fail. So uh, it, it, you, ha you have to be very, very quick on your bouncing back. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I decided to bounce back on my experiences in England uh, away from the UK, so I went to, to Russia and I had success there. Uh, the, the coming back is very, very important uh, for, for someone, uh, but the, the, the intolerance towards those who fail is, uh, is, uh, is a lot. Yeah. Christina, um, when, when you search your name on Google, you know, there's a headline from a couple of years ago that's who should replace Christina Miller when she gets fired? Yes. <laughs> and it is, it's part of the job overall now that if you have fans and you can make them love shows or love what you do, then there's the other side of it as well. So I think that um, we live in a very vocal society. We appreciate the fact when uh, something's trending or people are saying great things about you, there's always going to be another side of that. So I think it's, you know, it, it's about, one, you know, I don't really believe you should read the comments on anything at this point. Uh -huh. um, but uh, other than that, it's, it's, it 
it is part of the job at this point that people are going to be vocal. They're of an age where they're able to express themselves. The generation we serve, again, is the first mobile generation. They've been on social, me social media since they've been born. The average, um, if you're 12 or older, you don't know life without a cell phone, without an iPhone in particular. So when you start to look at those things, there's just space for people to evangelize or express their opinion. And I think that that is fine and that is open. And, you know, there definitely are places where people go too far, and that's that's going to be out there. So you've basically just accepted, for for instance, that you're going to be a public figure, and there will be going to be people with change.org petitions, yes, protesting Cartoon Network cancellations. But yes, and you, and you, but it sounds like it was interesting. You're saying you try and make sure you're tapped into positive feedback as well, which. All feedback, right? Yeah. There's good stuff and there's bad stuff, and you have to pay attention to both. And people genuinely love the shows and the um, the properties that we're creating. So they have passion for them, and passion isn't always going to come out positive. So I think you have to accept both. I hear you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about kind of some leadership challenges that each of you guys deal with individually. Um, Ralph. Esports and, and gaming more broadly, there's a cross section of people, you know, especially a couple years ago, who think this is all crazy. Maybe people would dispute, is this really sports? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you've talked about in a couple years, this will be seen as a fairly normal thing that society has adapted to. How do you deal with that as a leader? Just the fact that there are beyond just the day to day challenges of the job, but there are people who think that the entire industry you're dealing with is just nuts. How do you deal with that? That's very simple because you just know they are wrong. So dealing with okay. people where you know they have no basis for their counter argument is very easy to deal with. You either counter it with the same amount of ignorance that they are doing or um, a little bit more in a comedy way or just ignore it. I think in terms of feedback, it's, it's harder when it's right, right? When you get feedback that, that you did something wrong, you do something wrong, the product you're, you're delivering this weekend, the, the event, the stream, the whatever, that this is, is not good, there, our takeaway usually is that it's like the, 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 the fifth executive in the room is the community, it's the feedback online, which ultimately co-decides how we develop our product and where we have to listen. Um, it's very hard to swallow on the short term, <laughs> right? but it's uh, so valuable on the long term. I think the only thing is, and that, that no one should overestimate, is that the internet is very unfiltered but forgets very fast. It's not that the internet doesn't forget, it's the opposite. It right. forgets immediately. So, so even, if, even if people think, you know, this whole esports thing is crazy. In a couple years, you know, in a couple years, people think you're a genius. Right? So. Exactly. Or if you're the worst executive in the world, or <laughs> the worst coach in the world, that is that minute. And one week later, when you won 5-0 in next match, then he's the best coach in the world. So, there you opinion go. sways fast. Andre, one uh, criticism you've had to deal with for sure. Um, you're one of uh, a couple coaches, though a rising number of coaches who never played football professionally. Um, I, it's pretty easy to see why you know, some player might say, especially if they have any reason to be upset with you, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He hasn't played the game professionally. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Yeah, yeah well, what we try to do is understand what, what the player demands and wants from you. You know, so, uh, we, 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 in this time, we have to be sometimes a different type of leader to, to each type of player because uh, one demands an uh, arm around the shoulder, the other one demands a, a little bit more pressure. So we, we have to adapt as leaders to what, uh, what, what the other one wants. So uh, for that to happen, you have to be attentive to details. Uh, a, a person like me that doesn't come from a, a football playing experience, I have to dominate other areas. Uh, like you would be uh, better at other things. Yeah, we, uh, you know, on, on my communication skills, let's say, for example, on my training skills, on the nutrition, on, the, on, uh, on understanding uh, management. Um, the, the, the manager who has been a player has the ability to, to decide things by the experience, uh, experiences that he has uh, lived before. Uh, at this moment in time, there is a more a trend towards the, the, the managers that were ex-players. This was because you know, Zidane has won three European Cups recently, uh, Guardiola, Luis Enrique, Conte have all achieved uh, recent success. Uh, if, we if we speak a bit uh, like 10 years before, there was another trend, which was uh, Mourinho, Benitez, myself, 
So I, th I think it, there is a trend. Uh, what, what is the common pattern of all of us is that we have to be great motivators. Uh, we have to channel the passion that the players feel for the game because all of them, you know, no matter how rich they have become and how famous they have become, they have um, a child love for the game, and this is the passion that we need them to play every every Sunday. So every Sunday. So this is uh, what uh, what we are all the same is. Uh, we are all great motivators of people. That's what we try to be. Cool. And then last thing I want to talk about is just a question of responsibility of leaders. Um, you know, for instance, Christina, you're a business executive. You know, you run a company. You have guys have shareholders. Um, do you think your ultimate responsibility is to, you know, improve margins, make profits, build a business? Or how do you guys think about, like, who you're ultimately responsible for? Let's start with Ralph. I mean, do you feel like, is, is your sole objective as a CEO of, you know, a company that runs, you know, esports tournaments, is it solely to make money? Or how do you think about kind of what your responsibility is in 2018? So I, I think any company needs to first and foremost try to build something great, build a great product. In our case, it's actually to make the athletes stars. <clears throat> when we founded the company, I did it because I was a player, and the next generation of players should have gotten more recognition than, than my generation of players did. And uh, making money is a tool to achieve that. <laughs> um, it's a necessity, and it's a necessity as well for the shareholders to do it. Our job is to make ESL the largest, one of the largest sports brands out there. And we're going to achieve that simply by enabling players to become stars and be celebrated and be, be seen as exceptional, like football players, like any other athlete in the world. And then we're going to make money with it automatically, and everyone is happy. So you don't, you don't see the primary responsibility. You're saying the, 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 the business responsibilities are, are secondary, you feel like, to elevating yeah. the entire profession. It, it, it's even a cosmetical thing that you need to do. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Christina? I, I completely agree. They're interconnected, right? Our goal is to make great shows, to make kids laugh, make people laugh on an ongoing basis. If we're taking care of the audience, the consumer, the fan, those things come naturally. Yeah, there's business decisions that need to be made as part of that. There's employee decisions that need to be made part of that. But it's all interconnected. Can't be so black and white. We're there. I show up. We have shareholders. There's a commitment to delivering for them. But you do that by doing the best possible work sure. in there, content. There are times, though, where this conflicts, right? I mean, as we were talking about before, there'll be criticism. Why is this show that is beloved by a small fan base, but you know, and it is, is a good show, but maybe it doesn't have the mass audience appeal. That's something you got to deal with all the time, right? Absolutely. And sometimes you can wait and watch shows grow, and it depends when in its life cycle. It, I mean, there's lots of factors when you're making a, a business decision, um, but I, I ultimately think that it's about making the best possible product and experience for your audience and your fans, and that delivers those business results people are looking for. There you go. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.